Acts 2, 36, 38. This goal of preaching to all nations and all tongues that the uh, Bible talk ministry has uh, dovetails perfectly into the Bible passage for the lesson that was read this morning. Now you know this is a pretty familiar passage here. It is Pentecost Sunday and the crowds that have come to Jerusalem from many nations, they've come to celebrate this feast and they have witnessed the miracle of tongues where they hear each in their own language the different apostles proclaiming Jesus Christ. Now I make one last reference to Bible talk here to note that the miracle of tongues that was done here at Pentecost so that all could hear the gospel in their own language is now being reproduced today with technology. It's not a miracle today. But 2,000 years later, we're trying to reproduce what the Holy Spirit did with the apostles in those days. And I believe that God has provided both in order to fulfill His will that we preach to every tribe and every, and every tongue. Now, as far as Acts chapter 2, verse 36, 38 is concerned, I believe that you know, Marty and I, as well as other teachers, have clearly explained that repentance and baptism are the proper response of faith when one hears the good news of Jesus Christ. I mean, when you hear the good news, the right response is to repent and be baptized. In other words, repentance and baptism, which is immersion in water, are the proper expressions of the believer's faith in Jesus Christ. Peter could have said at that moment, okay, everybody, raise your hand, snap your fingers, and you will be forgiven for your sins and receive the gift of the Lord. He could have said, all right, everybody needs to walk to Bethlehem and then walk back while saying they believe in Jesus. And if you do that, then your sins will be forgiven. You know what I'm saying? I want everybody to take a sharp object and to cut the inside of their hand so that they can get some blood and then take the blood and rub it on their foreheads. And if you do that, your sins will be forgiven and you'll receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. But he didn't say that, did he? To the question, what should we do? He said, repent and be baptized in the name of Jesus for the forgiveness of your sins and you shall receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. So by these, I demonstrate that I understand and believe that Jesus is the Son of God. I'm also assured that this congregation has also received a lot of lessons dealing with the meaning of repentance and the proper biblical mode for baptism, which is full immersion in water and done by the authority of the Father, the Son, Jesus, and the Holy Spirit. Now, Peter mentions that upon repentance and baptism, the believer receives the forgiveness of sins, which I think everybody understands. But he also says they receive the gift of the Holy Spirit, which is what I would like to focus on with the rest of my lesson this morning. First question that I get about this <clears throat> when studying with people is the following. Is this you know, gift of the Holy Spirit the same thing as the gifts of the Spirit? In other words, does this gift mean that I should expect to exercise some kind of supernatural powers like some of the people did in the New Testament? And the answer to that is no. The gifts or the ability to perform signs and miracles were given by God to certain people for very specific reasons, but not to everybody in the first century. For example, the gifts, in other words, when I say gifts here, I'm meaning the empowering to do miracles. For example, the gifts given to the Apostles, it says, but you, Jesus said, but you will receive power. There's the empowering. When the Holy Spirit has come upon you and you shall be my witnesses both in Jerusalem and in all of Judea and Samaria and even to the remotest part of the earth. And the reason why the apostles received power to do miracles, among other things, was to confirm with signs and miracles the gospel that they were preaching, that the gospel they were preaching was actually true. 
So they go into a village and they say, Jesus, he's the Messiah. Jesus, we saw him, you know, he's resurrected. Jesus is the one, repent and be baptized. And the people go back and say, says you, says you. And then Peter would heal somebody. And then one of the apostles would raise someone from the dead or one of the apostles would take the leprosy or one of the apostles will cast spirits out of somebody to demonstrate that what they were saying was actually true. If you don't believe me just based on my words, believe my words based on what I have just done. Okay. So the apostles received gifts. There's another example kind of an outlier example, and that is Cornelius in Acts chapter 10. It says, while Peter was still speaking these words, Peter was speaking to a household where Cornelius, uh, who was a Roman centurion, he was the head of the household. He says, while Peter was still speaking these words, the Holy Spirit fell upon all those who were listening to the message. All of the circumcised believers who came with Peter were amazed because the gift of the Holy Spirit had been poured out on the Gentiles also. For they were hearing them speaking with tongues and exalting God. Then Peter answered, surely no one can refuse the water for these to be baptized who have received the Holy Spirit just as we did, can he? And he ordered them to be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ. Then they asked him to stay for a few days. As I said, Cornelius was a Roman military officer, sincerely looking for the truth. And so Peter was sent to him to preach the gospel. Now the purpose here for the miraculous tongues that these people were using was to provide a sign to the apostles that Cornelius and all the Gentiles like him were to receive the gospel, just like the Jews received the gospel. You see, Peter and the apostles at first, they were under the impression that, yeah, they had to, they had to share the good news all over the world to the Jews all over the world. You know, go everywhere where the Jews are and preach the gospel to them. And so God works this miracle. He puts the tongues into the mouths of Gentiles as a signal, as a sign to Peter and the others that it was okay to preach to non-Jews as well. Another group, the disciples. It says, now when the disciples or the apostles in Jerusalem heard that Samaria had received the word of God, they sent them Peter and John who came down and prayed for them that they might receive the Holy Spirit. For he had not yet fallen upon any of them. They had simply been baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus. Then they began laying their hands on them and they were receiving the Holy Spirit. Again, the empowering, the empowerment of individuals to speak tongues and to do works and miracles. This was transferred by the laying on of the hands of the apostles. The purpose, of course, was to help the early church to evangelize, to organize and to protect itself at a time when it did not have all the recorded scriptures in hand. Now you need to understand that the term the Holy Spirit fell on them or they received the Holy Spirit. These were interchangeable terms used to describe the empowerment of an individual to do certain miraculous works. So let me, let me simplify it for you. There are two things that happen with the Holy Spirit and a lot of times different you know, uh, uh, terms used to describe it. One is the empowerment of the Spirit. The empowerment of the Spirit, and they use terms like He fell on them, He came to them. You know. The empowerment of the Spirit is when the Holy Spirit enabled an individual to do miracles, to speak in tongues. That's the empowering. In Acts chapter 2 verse 38, we're talking about the indwelling of the Spirit. The indwelling of the Spirit is when the Spirit comes and dwells within the individual. These two are separate things, okay? Separate things. So as far as the empowering is concerned, these gifts, these empowerments were no longer given once the Bible was completed and the apostles died. Today, the Bible is the tool that we use to empower individuals to be saved, to believe, to do uh, service in the church, and so on and so forth. So that's the empowerment. So 
what's this other thing? What's this indwelling thing? Well, the indwelling is the Holy Spirit, a divine being of the Godhead given to the believer. God not only speaking to man through his word, but now dwelling within man through the person of the Holy Spirit. Now in order to understand this, we need to just go back to the Old Testament for a moment. In the Old Testament, they had a concept about the Holy Spirit. The expectation of the people in the, whole, in the Old Testament was that with, when the Messiah would come and the age of deliverance would come, also would come the Spirit of God in a mighty way. In other words, they understood that not only the prophets and not only the special servants, as had happened in the past, would have the Spirit, but in a new and dynamic way, the Spirit would be on everybody. Let me read, for example, passages that talk about this. In Isaiah 44, Isaiah says, or God says through Isaiah, for I will pour out water on the thirsty land and streams on the dry ground. I will pour out my spirit on your offspring and blessing on your descendants. And then in Joel 2, 28, Joel says, it will come about after this that I will pour out my spirit on all mankind and your sons and daughters will prophesy, your old men will dream dreams, your young men will see uh, visions. So in the Old Testament, the hope was when the Messiah comes, the Holy Spirit would be with all the people, not just with the kings or prophets or the judges or the special people. Everybody, everybody would have the Spirit and everybody would have the Spirit all the time. Because in the Old Testament, you'd hear the prophets say, the Spirit came upon me and then they would speak. Or you'd hear David said, please Lord, do not take your Spirit from me. He would come and go. The promise was when the Messiah comes, the Spirit will be with the, the young, the old, the poor, the rich, no, no barriers. Everybody would have the Spirit. And so in the New Testament, Jesus and the apostles repeat this promise and they explain how it has been fulfilled. So in John 14, Jesus says, if you love me, you will keep my commandments. I will ask the Father and he will give you another helper that he may be with you forever. That is the spirit of truth whom the world cannot receive because it does not see him or know him, but you know him because he abides with you and will be in you. And then in verse 23 says, Jesus answered and said to him, if anyone loves me, he will keep my word and my father will love him and we will come to him and make our abode with him. Anybody who was paying attention to what Jesus was saying there immediately thought to the past, oh, wait a minute. Oh, wait a minute. He's promising us that he is the one who is going to give us the spirit. Not everybody was listening, but those who were understood. Now the word abode here means a dwelling place or a home. Note that it says that it is God himself who will dwell within the believer through the actual person of the Holy Spirit. Not just the teachings or the ideas or the love of God, but God himself will dwell within anyone who obeys God. Well, obeys what? Well, repent and be baptized. <laughs> and you shall receive what? Forgiveness and what? Uh, the Spirit. So in Romans chapter 8, verse 11, Peter, uh, Paul says, but if the spirit of him who raised Jesus from the dead dwells in you, he who raised Christ Jesus from the dead will also give life to your mortal bodies through his spirit who dwells in you. So Paul explains plainly that it is the Holy Spirit himself who indwells the Christian. I mean, he says it twice. Now indwells, that word indwells, it comes from a Greek word meaning house. The form here means to live in a house. It's the same word for those who live together in marriage that Paul talks about in 1 Corinthians 7, 12. So Paul is saying that the same Holy Spirit that indwelled Jesus and raised him up on the third day, that spirit also dwells 
in the Christian and powers his spiritual life as well. The implication is that the Holy Spirit dwells, of course, within the Christian. Paul doesn't explain the mechanics of how a divine being can inhabit a mortal body. I mean, how does that happen? I don't know. I don't even understand how television works yet. You know, how does the image get to my screen? You know, how does that happen? Paul only says that it happens. I mean, do you have to understand how the image gets to your screen to be able to watch the TV? No. You have to understand exactly the mechanics or the metaphysics of how a divine being can dwell inside of a, an individual person? No, you don't have to understand how it works to believe that it does work. You know, faith is believing God at His word even when we don't see. The Hebrew writer, what does he say? By faith we understand that the worlds were prepared by the word of God so that what is seen was not made out of things which are visible. You know, I believe that God created the world, I just don't know exactly how He did that. And so we read in 1 Corinthians chapter 3, He says, Do you not know that you are a temple of God and that the Spirit of God dwells in you? If any man destroys the temple of God, God will destroy him, for the temple of God is holy, and that is what you are. So Paul again uses the same Greek word dwell, except this time the image of the, the individual is of a temple and the Holy Spirit as living or dwelling within is clearly put forward. Let me give you another passage here. 2 Timothy 1.14 says guard, Paul says to Timothy, guard through the Holy Spirit who, in, who dwells in us the treasure which has been entrusted to you. Note that Timothy is to guard by the power of the Holy Spirit dwelling within him, same word. What is he to guard? The treasure entrusted to him. The treasure is not the Holy Spirit. The treasure is the word of God, the gospel through which he obtained salvation and the Holy Spirit. So Timothy possessed both the word and the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit dwelled in him, the word of God was entrusted to him. He had to guard the word through the power of the Holy Spirit. These were two separate things. Now, you might be wondering, why is he emphasizing this point? Why are we doing this? I'm doing this because some people believe and teach that the Holy Spirit dwells in us simply through the internalization of the word. In other words, when they read Acts 2.38, oh yeah, yeah, spirit dwells in you. you know, as you read and as you understand the word of God, there's the Holy Spirit coming in you. They don't believe in the quote dynamic indwelling of the Holy Spirit. So some people teach that the way that the Holy Spirit dwells in us is through the word. There's no actual divine indwelling. In other words, the way we have the Holy Spirit is by knowing and internalizing the word of God, which is given to us by the Holy Spirit. I believe that this is not what the Bible teaches. The Bible doesn't teach that by words and images it uses, you, 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 you receive the Spirit. The Bible teaches that an actual person of the Holy Spirit lives inside of every person. How? I don't know how. How can God be everywhere? I don't know. <laughs> so when the apostles referred to indwelling, they meant that the Holy Spirit himself came into the person. They didn't explain how, only that it happened. For example, we don't ever say that it was the devil's ideas or words that inhabited demon-possessed people that Jesus cured, do we? You ever say that? I mean, he, Jesus spoke to these and he literally brought them out of people. You know, when, when, the, when he, he, the devils went into the pigs, you know, the swine and the swine you know, ran off the, the cliff. 
what Jesus did, he didn't send just the ideas and words into the pigs. <laughs> they were actual spirits that went into the pigs. So why should we have trouble with the idea that the Spirit of God could also inhabit man for good instead of for evil? We kind of easily believe that uh, uh, an evil spirit lived inside of a person and Jesus cast him out. Why can't we believe that div the divine spirit can live in a person in order to raise him up on the last day? So I believe therefore that when Peter says the gift of the Holy Spirit, he's saying that the divine spirit of God comes to dwell with the individual. The Old Testament prophets promised him. John proclaimed him. Peter offered him. Paul explained him. Jesus gives him. And all who obey the gospel receive him within themselves. You know, we emphasize Acts 2.38. We always emphasize the baptism part. And that's fine. That's one part of the equation. That it's by immersion. It's, you're baptized when you believe as a, as, as a reasoning individual and so on and so forth. And, and then we say, oh yeah, and then you get the indwelling of the Holy Spirit. We kind of say, oh yeah, there's that thing too. But we really focus in. There are a lot more books about baptism than there are about the indwelling of the Holy Spirit. But if you were a Jew and if you were listening to Peter, I want to tell you the thing that resonated with you was not baptism. Because if you were a Jew, you were familiar with it. Yeah, baptism, repentance, sure, that's what John preached. John the Baptist, yeah, we know, we know that. No, the thing that resonated with you was, huh, the gift of the, is it that time? Is that the time that is now? Is that what we're going to receive? I think we forget to emphasize that idea. So here's the next question that comes up. How do I know that I have the Holy Spirit if I do not perform signs or miracles? You may be wondering, why did he start over there with the signs, you know, the empowering? The indwelling is not the same as the empowering. People who are indwelled with the Spirit do not necessarily perform miracles. Well, if I don't perform miracles, how do I know he's inside me? Well, we can know that we possess the Holy Spirit now because we can perceive His presence in a variety of ways, even if we don't do miracles. And I want to wrap up my lesson by giving you a couple of these, okay? Number one, we know we have the Spirit because God's promise is sure to those who obey Him. The surest confirmation is God's word. And if God has promised that those who repent and are immersed have the Spirit, then they do have the Spirit. You know, the reverse is also true. Those who do not repent and refuse to be immersed for forgiveness, well, they don't possess the Spirit, no matter what they say, no matter what they do. You know, when you've messed up for the thousandth time and you wonder, you know, am I, am I still going to make it? How, 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 do you, how do you strengthen yourself? Well, I don't know about you, but I think of Romans 8, 1. There's now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. Is that true? Well, okay. Am I in Christ? Yes. Move on. Move on. Number two. People who have the indwelling of the Holy Spirit have a new desire for spiritual things. You know, our flesh drives us to seek for security and satisfaction of our needs, gratification of our desires, and much of our mental and physical energies you know, are invested in these things. Some good, not so good. The Holy Spirit, on the other hand, motivates us to seek and experience spiritual things. Things like prayer, for example. Paul says in the same way, the Spirit also helps our weakness for we do not know how to pray as we should, but the Spirit himself intercedes for us with groanings too deep for words. He is our prayer partner. He encourages us to pray with reassurance that our prayers will be heard. He stirs us to go to God and he keeps our prayers before God, before the throne of God. You know, why should we ask and why should we seek and why should we knock? Because the Holy Spirit is always there to help us, that's why. Another way we know. Another way we know is that we have a desire for righteousness. Romans 8 says, so then brethren, we're not under obligation, not to the flesh, to live according to the flesh, for if you are living according to the flesh, you must die. 
But if by the Spirit you are putting to death the deeds of the body, you will live. Galatians 5.22 says, but the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, and so on and so forth. The Spirit leads us into the doing of good. The Spirit initiates in us a desire for higher moral standards and the cultivation of a more Christ-like character. The Spirit gives us a hunger and a thirst for righteousness. Why is it that you want to do the right thing, even though you don't feel like doing the right thing. That's the spirit that's pushing you. Another way that we know, another way that we know that we have the spirit is that we have a greater intimacy with God. Ephesians uh, chapter three, uh, verses 14, uh, to 19. It says, for this reason I bow my knees before the Father, from whom every family in heaven and on earth derives its name, from whom every uh, family in the heaven on earth derives its name, that He would grant you according to the riches of His glory to be strengthened with power through His Spirit in the inner man, so that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith, and that you, being rooted and grounded in love, may be able to comprehend uh, with all the saints, what is the breadth and length and height and depth and to know the love of Christ which surpasses knowledge that you may be filled up to all the fullness of God. What's he talking about? The Spirit of God helps you to know God. You know, there's a relationship between the Word and the Holy Spirit and our own spirit that deepens our sense of knowledge and intimacy with our Lord. The Holy Spirit acts as a facilitator or an enabler to get us to know and have a relationship with a being whose nature and scope that our faculties, weakened by sin, we have a difficult time in relating to. Listen, if a guy came here from uh, central China, a village in central China, right? He just, we just transported him here and sat him here. He would like be on Mars. Or let's say they took us and put us there in central China at a little bit. We would, it would be like Mars. We're going to relate to these people, what they ate, what they spoke, what, what's important to them. They're, they're thinking, they're so, you know, we couldn't relate. And they're human beings. <laughs> Imagine the problem we have with God <laughs> to relate to Him. What Paul is saying here, the Holy Spirit is there to help you relate to God, this being that is so different than you. And the knowledge of God brings you peace and confidence and joy. And then another thing, service in the kingdom. In this passage, Paul talks about miraculous abilities as well as the abilities to serve and to teach that are still with us today. In the New Testament, we learn that every believer receives the Holy Spirit and that the Holy Spirit enables every believer to minister in some way. If one preaches, well, he does so by the grace of God and the help of the Holy Spirit. If one teaches, he or she does so how? Well, by the grace of God and the help of the Holy Spirit. If one sings or prays or cleans or fixes or visits or gives or organizes, they do so through the grace of God and the strength of the Holy Spirit. Now, a caveat, a disclaimer, I don't believe that the Holy Spirit empowers you to be a better sweeper or to be a better teacher because he indwells you. In the world, these skills, they come with training and effort. I do believe, however, that the Holy Spirit gives you the strength and the faith to sweep and to serve and to give for something that you cannot see. That is his work insofar as our ministries are concerned. People in the world, they fix, they serve, they give for something that they can see and touch and taste. The Holy Spirit, on the other hand, helps us to continue to do the best we can for something that we yet cannot see. I know I have the Holy Spirit because I'm spending my life serving a Lord I cannot see and dying for a kingdom that I cannot touch. That's the work of the Holy Spirit. In John chapter three, 
<laughs> You're tuning up already? I'm not done yet. John chapter three. That's one way to tell a guy he's done. You know, I used to watch people looking at their watch. You know what I'm saying? Nah. All right. As long as you do it for Marty, I'm OK with it. John chapter three, verse five, we're near the end. It says, Jesus answered, truly, truly, I say to you, unless one is born of water and the spirit, he cannot enter into the kingdom of God. That which is born of the flesh is flesh, and that which is born of the spirit is spirit. Do not be amazed that I said to you, you must be born again. The wind blows where it wishes, and you hear the sound of it, but do not know where it comes from and where it is going. So is everyone who is born of the spirit. So Jesus uses a parallel between the work of the spirit and the wind. And he explains how one can you know, know the presence of the Holy Spirit without seeing him. You know, we can't observe the Holy Spirit as, as he works within the Christian, just like we can't see the wind. But what the Holy Spirit accomplishes within the Christian is visible proof of his presence, just like the blowing leaves and the rolling waves are proof of the presence of the... If I want to know the work of the Holy Spirit, I just look back over the 38 years that I've been a Christian. I look at the things that have happened. I look at the things that have been accomplished in the last 38 years. And that tells me that wasn't me working because I would have never wanted to do anything like that. That was the spirit working. That you survived the death of a spouse and remain faithful. That you survived the death of your marriage and remain faithful. That you survived getting old and remain faithful. That's the work of the Spirit. I could keep naming things, you know, but you know what I'm talking about. That you survived the injustice of losing your business because somebody cheated you and the government rolled over you and you got no help from anybody. And you remained faithful to the Lord. Yeah, that's, that's the Holy Spirit working in you. That's how you know. You know, many people go too far in looking for proof of the possession of the Spirit. You know, they think if you can't speak tongues, you don't have the Spirit. Well, that's a doctrine not of our brotherhood. Others, on the other hand, limit the work of the Spirit by relegating His presence to an internalization of information, therefore voiding His dynamic power within the individual. But God's word answers all who believe in Jesus Christ, repent of their sins and are baptized, that He will give them the Holy Spirit to dwell in them forever. And all those who do so will perceive His presence as they see their spiritual lives grow in assurance and righteous living and intimacy and communication with God and His Son, Jesus Christ. Every time Jesus is preached, God offers every listener forgiveness for every sin ever committed and the gift of the Holy Spirit dwelling in your heart. And it's no different this morning. If you don't have the Spirit, then come and accept the gracious offer of God by confessing Jesus, repenting and being immersed in water. If you do have the Spirit, but because of sin and unfaithfulness, you have offended Him and you have quenched His power within you, why not come and be restored through prayer as we sing, as stand and sing the song to which we have been attuned <laughs> earlier on. Let's stand and sing, and if the Spirit is moving you to respond, please do so now.